Hi, this is Dr. Bob Danahoff for the Public Health Office from Douglas County. Today is December the 15th, and we're going to be doing another of our live updates. This is now our ninth month of doing this twice a week, so it's been a long time, and I hope we can be done soon. I'm going to take my mask down as I'm the only person in this room here, but this is your chance to ask questions. We've already got some really good questions in the uh, Facebook questions at douglaspublichealthnetwork.org. We'll do those first but then we'll go ahead and answer any questions you'll put in the chat section here. As usual, we start at the top and move down as to what's happening in the world, and uh, it's pretty grim. So 74 million cases in the world, 1.6 million deaths. The disease is still rapidly rising in the world, especially in the U.S., Russia, Turkey, Brazil, Mexico, and now Germany has seen an increase in the number of cases. So it's increasing in many places around the world, going down in other places, since it's the UK, Italy, and France, uh, but going up in other areas. So the total number of cases and the total number of deaths is going up. Still, the U.S. has far and away the most number of new cases. <clears throat> it has more cases than Russia, India, Turkey, Brazil, UK, Italy, Germany, and Mexico combined. We've been averaging uh, uh, 200, over 200,000 cases and over 2,300 deaths a day. In the U.S., we're at 17 million cases, 311,000 deaths as of this morning. Uh, 37 states with more than 1,000 cases. So really all over the country, especially hot in Tennessee and in, and in uh, California. And the hospital counts keep climbing now, over 110,000 people in the hospital. When you think of it, that, you know, 110,000, hard to put that in perspective. There are only a maximum of 980,000 beds in the U.S. So about one in 10 beds is being used by a COVID patient, which, which what we say, well, that's not so bad. There's still, you know, the other left. But there are certain things that just happen on a regular basis, like births and heart attacks and cancer. And so there is not 100,000 open beds. And that's why there's a lot of struggle for beds, especially in places like Southern California. When you look at the heat map for the country, it's really bright red, except for Maine, Vermont, Hawaii, and Southern Oregon. So Maine, Vermont, Hawaii, relatively low number of cases, and Southern Oregon. In Oregon, we're at 93,000 cases, about 1,100 deaths. They reported over 50 deaths today in Oregon. Now, some of this is a bunch of deaths from the last week that got reported all in one group, and you'll hear more about that today. It does look like our cases peaked in in uh, Oregon le- end of November, beginning of December, and that our deaths are now starting to peak. Remember, as I've said many times before, gatherings like we had in the first week of November are followed by cases like we had in the middle of November, hospitalizations, which we had in the end of November, and then deaths, which we're starting to see now. Um, Although still, Oregon has the fifth lowest case rate, the fifth lowest death rate, rate, and the third lowest rate of new new cases. In Douglas County, uh, we have 12,022 cases. We reported 14 new cases today. We have 15 in the hospitalization and reported four new deaths today. These four new deaths today are related to one of our, our nursing homes that was reported previously, and these were deaths that have occurred over the last week and were all reported in a, in a batch yesterday. Our heart really goes out to, to all the families that have lost loved ones. Um, again, many of these people were older and some were sick, but still, they were people's moms and grandmas who did not expect to die this quickly. As we've talked about before, there were five big super spreader outbreaks in in November. Thank goodness we've not seen any yet in December. And we have not seen a lot of Thanksgiving disease. We have a couple of 2Z, 3Zs, but none of the big outbreaks like we expected we might see. So thank you, thank you to people to go ahead and do that. Um, Big news for the week is the vaccine. The uh, Pfizer vaccine got approved last week. And it started to actually be given. I think yesterday there were some people gave the gave the vaccine yesterday, and I think this week in Oregon we'll see people get vaccinated. So that's great. Okay, let me go through the questions, uh, and we'll do that. Uh, so my parents had coronavirus in October. My family of four has been practicing social distancing, avoiding social gatherings, and working from home. 
The only true exposure we've had is through my kids' daycare. We plan on visiting my parents at Christmas time with both households doing quarantine leading up to the visit. As a side note, they're in Lane County. We just found out that my parents are planning to attend a large family gathering at Christmas time since they po tested positive in October where they have antibodies from preventing them from getting it again. So what we do know is that once you've had the disease, you're much less likely to get it in the le much less likely to get it in the next 90 days. Although the reason I was a little late tonight is that we have a case that had it about two months ago and now has it again. So having it October is is better than it gives you a little more protection than if you didn't have it. But there's no guarantee there. If your kids go to daycare, that's a risk because remember, kids can have the disease and be relatively asymptomatic and, and doing it. Again, the more gatherings you have outside your group, the more chance that you'll bring this in there. And it's always hard to predict what the risk is. And, you know, you've got people who are older and people for whom this is a bad disease. The recommendation is this year, stay home for Christmas until we can get this disease down and then we can go back and do the things we want to do but for now, the strategy you do in quarantining is great. Uh, people have had it in the past, again, would be less likely. Quarantining and being careful, certainly all useful. But the only way to be sure you're not going to get it is to just avoid those, avoid those big gatherings. And again, this is hard. Just had a grandbaby uh, 10 days ago. And, you know, we would love to go see that grandbaby. But the idea of perhaps bringing disease or getting disease from elsewhere is, is worrisome. So if someone travels outside of the area, particularly out of state, are they required to quarantine for 14 days upon the return? It is recommended that they quarantine. There are no quarantine police. There's nobody to come to your door, but it is strongly recommended that people who travel from out of state quarantine. We're still having out of state cases. Just this afternoon, we had another new case from Tennessee. So, you know, we have my list of states that have given us disease, and it's a long list. I don't, there are just very few states left Alaska, Washington, California, Arizona, Nevada, Idaho, Wyoming, Michigan, uh, Louisiana, Florida, Texas, Ohio, Missouri, Tennessee, Massachusetts, Virginia, Montana, Colorado, Minnesota, Utah, North Carolina, and Colorado. So, I mean, the, when you travel, you just have that risk for two reasons. One is there's a lot more disease in the rest of the country than there is here. So, for example, you say, well, I went to Idaho. There's 10 times as much disease in Idaho per capita as there is in Oregon. So there's a higher chance you'll get it. And it's just then the travel. When you travel, you do have contacts with lots of people. So really be careful about, about traveling and really you can to quarantine. So should hospital staff wear their uniforms out of the hospital if working with COVID patients? So the question is how much disease actually gets on your clothes. This virus is pretty much a respiratory virus. It's pretty much not a contact virus. And so the risk from clothes and whatever, uh, books, groceries and whatever is relatively low. It is, however, always best to leave your dirty clothes at work and then have clean clothes when you come home. So my follow-up is that while I'm planning to quarantine when seeing my family with testing, after five days, allow me confidence to shorten my quarantine. So we have shortened the quarantine for people who are exposed to cases. So somebody else in your family has it. The previous was 14 days. And while 14 days is still the safest uh, you, for people who are relatively low risk, they can go 10 days. Or you can go five days in that. Now, if you're not a contact and you're just an asymptomatic person, can you do that? It hasn't been studied. I don't know. I would think it would probably be safe, but it hasn't been studied. All right. So let me see this one here. I saw my daughter on Tuesday for four hours. And a test came back positive on Wednesday. Yikes. She went through the drive through and they said she's positive. Um, uh, so let me see if I get this right. On Tuesday, you're with your daughter. On Wednesday, she's positive. So on Wednesday, she's positive. So on Tuesday, she was clearly contagious and you were clearly exposed. So you were clearly exposed on Tuesday. So that means that you should 
most safely quarantine for two weeks, which would be two Tuesdays hence, or uh, 10 days. Um, um, I did a rapid test yesterday on myself, which was negative. So on Tuesday, you were exposed. You did a rapid test on Friday. I would expect it to be negative because it's only three days later. You are definitely, definitely, definitely not safe to go back to work, especially with high-risk people. The minimum time, the absolute minimum time for quarantine is seven days, and that's with a negative test on the fifth or sixth day. So clearly, clearly, we would not recommend that you go back to work until a minimum of seven days with a negative test on the fifth, sixth, or seventh day. A negative test on the second or third day tells you nothing. A negative test on the second or third day is 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 worse than useless because it gives you the sense that you're going to be negative when you could clearly be positive. So, I would I would I, I would say no on that one. Um, so, would I please clarify what protection these two first vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna, can realistically be expected to provide? So, greater than ninety percent effective sounds great, but is that ninety percent immunity against infection? <clears throat> or do the vaccines presumably reduce the the possibility of death uh, or hospitalization? Well, it does both. So when they looked at the number of cases, the number of cases was decreased by about 90%, and the number of severe cases re- representing hospitalization was down more than 90%. So yes, I think it's going to be very effective, and I would recommend everybody get it. Hold on a second. <coughs> so... In the 1980s, I took the hepatitis C vaccine. I had to take a couple of boosters for the vaccine to take me with after the vaccine. Well, that doesn't make sense because there is no hepatitis C vaccine. <coughs> so, presume you mean the hepatitis B vaccine. And yes, on that one, you did need two boosters. And this one, you only need one. <clears throat> Ryan, could you get me a cup of water? Um, so Laura says, with everything I've read about the vaccine, is it still safe for type 1 diabetics? I think the answer is yes. This was tested in people with lots of underlying disease. There were some diabetics in the group, and they did do okay. Now, the problem was they had 10,000 people, and they had people with all kinds of underlying conditions. Now, they didn't have 10,000 diabetics. So, it's a, so you're not going to know specifically about that, but there was nothing to suggest that this would not be safe for diabetics. Sherry says, has the vaccine reached Roseburg yet? Not quite yet, although the freezer to do so has, and we expect the vaccine later in this week. The first vaccine we're going to get is going to be for hospital personnel. So uh, Sandy says, if you have COVID, can you get the vaccine? Well, the recommendation is if you've had COVID in the last 90 days that you don't get the vaccine and hold off and let somebody who's not had COVID and presumably doesn't have antibodies get the vaccine first. Uh, do I know when the urgent cares will be able to get the vaccine? I think they're going to be in the second group. So hospitals are going to get it first. Thank you. Um, so hospitals are going to get it first this week. Uh, the clinics and the urgent cares are likely to get it in the next time after that. So I would hope sometime in late December or early January. Diane says, am I going to get the vaccine? Absolutely. I will be in the 1A group since I'm still seeing patients and swabbing noses. Uh, I'll be in the 1A group and I will get it as soon as it's available. Um, So who will decide who and when will be able to get the vaccine? So this is a complicated story. The CDC has set aside some general guidelines. 1A, hospital workers and nursing home personnel. 1B, essential workers, 1C, high-risk people, to the general population. And then the state is going to go ahead and make the finer gradations. So when you talk about healthcare personnel, for example, does that include janitors in the hospital? The answer is yes. Does it include people who work in admin at the hospital? Still figure that out. And so um, they're going to figure this out. So... Um, that's how it's going to work. There's a group that's going to work on this and look at this. But I think in general, healthcare workers and nursing home people in the next month or two, after that, essential workers, and then after that, other other high-risk people, 
we think by the summertime, late spring or early summer, we'll have enough vaccine to give it to everyone. So if you wear a mask and the person you visit wears a mask and you maintain six feet of distance, can you still socialize? Well, it's certainly a whole lot safer than being within two feet and not wearing a mask. But again, in the whole risk of things, it's much less risky than no masks sitting closer, but there still is some risk. I think uh, generally that's a level that many people could, could assume that level of risk. So Dale Ann says, do you have a sense of the percentage of people who will accept the vaccine if offered? This is a gr Nobody knows the answer to this question. Uh, it has been anywhere from 30% to 80% said they would take it. A lot will depend upon the initial experience, right? If, if there's some big side effects or whatever, I imagine the amount will go down. It will also uh, depend upon the clarity of the messaging. I think so far the messaging has been pretty clear. And I think it will also depend upon what leaders or thought leaders in the community do. So not that I'm a thought leader, but I mean, if I said, oh, I'm not going to get it. And Dr. Gray said, oh, I'm not going to get it. Then I think other people will say, well, they must know something I don't know. I'm not going to get it. But I think when I get it, when Dr. Gray gets it, when Dr. Seeley gets it, I think people are going to say, yeah, if they know a lot about it and get the vaccine, then I should get it too. So we're going to be working on that messaging in the next bit. So I'm hoping it's going to be 60 to 80% of the people, which will be enough to get us to the community immunity. Do I think it's going to be everybody? No. There's some people so deeply skeptical that there won't. But you know what? I'm not about to try and convince people who are deeply skeptical of anything, but I think there are enough people out there who want the vaccine that we're going to be able to get to a level of vaccination that this disease is going to go away. So do you know what plan is for household members of healthcare workers for getting their own vaccine? So this was one of the things we had talked about today was about, uh, about families. For the most part, families are in their, uh, the people in the family are in their own group. So if, for example, uh, mom is a doctor and dad is a, a, a essential worker, mom would get it in 1A and dad would get it in 1, 1B. Um, so why were the deaths recorded today that happened in December? This was a reporting issue with the place where, the, where they died and where we're dealing with that. Um, it's a reporting issue. Um, and they were reported today. Uh, one of the questions is about how the vaccine comes. So the vaccine comes frozen. The Pfizer vaccine comes frozen. It needs to be uh, defrosted just like you defrost food in your refrigerator, but not in the microwave, for two or three hours in the refrigerator. The vaccine then needs to be treated in a very special way and then diluted with, um, and then diluted with uh, normal saline, which is just salt water. Uh, it can then be given, but it has to be given relatively quickly. It's not very stable once it hits room temperature. It's going to be given then at room temperature. Um, Typing here. Okay, so let me go through a few things that we had some really interesting things. There is some disease that has been found in wild mink. So mink are mostly farmed, but there are also some wild mink and wild ferrets. And this is the first time we've found the disease in a wild animal. Again, not surprisingly that ferrets and mink would carry this disease because for respiratory diseases, ferrets and, and people are actually quite a bit alike. And we've used ferrets for a long time to work on our flu data. And so it's not surprising that mink and mink farms would get this. But now we're starting to see that this has also been in uh, wild mink. Also in large cats. So we've seen uh, lions and ocelots now get it. So large cats, mink, people, and pangolins. Really nothing similar between these animals other than they seem to get the disease. And that is what is weird about diseases is that they'll hit one species, not a very close species like chimpanzees, but then a distant species like ferrets or mink. It's weird. Um, more news on the long haulers. So now that the long haulers have been out 
longer time and they've been more studied, it really does seem to be a real phenomena where people do have symptoms that go on for weeks or months after their severe illnesses. Now, some of this is just related to being severely ill, no matter what you're severely ill with. So we know that people are in the ICU with trauma, people who are in the ICU after a heart attack, people in the ICU after cardiac arrest will frequently have symptoms of uh, neurologic symptoms of this fuzziness where they will have symptoms of uh, depression following. And so some of what's happening with the COVID people may just be that they were so darn sick and in the hospital, but some seem to be really very specific to COVID, especially the loss of sense of smell and taste, these long-term heart issues. And these long-term heart issues are, are, are going to be a worry, right? When we see these college athletes playing, knowing that many of them had COVID, and then see one drop on the court as we did this week in basketball, it makes us worry if COVID is causing that. We still are not really sure what's happening with COVID and the heart. We do know that there are some long-term lung issues from COVID, and many of these people have really decreased lung function. The the bad news is it doesn't seem to be decreasing any further. The bad news is it doesn't seem to be getting better very quickly either. And your lungs are one of those things that once damaged are really hard to fix. And that's why people who smoke or people have cystic fibrosis just can't make their lungs better. Once your lungs are damaged, they're really, really hard to fix. Um, there's also some very interesting stuff about why some people are totally well with this. They get a little bit of, they get no symptoms at all. Other people get a mild respiratory illness and seem to get better. And then some people get so very sick, especially men. And there seems to be this um, thing called an autoantibody. So one of the things that this virus does in some people is that in addition to causing the other havoc it's causing, it seems to be inducing your body to make antibodies against a chemical called interferon-1. And interferon-1 is usually the chemical that you use to help fight an infection. So if you now have an antibody against the interferon-1, and interferon-1 is kind of left out of the thing, your, your body may, may struggle in fighting this infection. It really is an incredibly clever mechanism by the virus to do that. But that could well explain why some people get really sick with this and then other people not so much. Um, been a lot of question on this virus. Is this a man-made virus? Where did it come from? When did it come from? And what they're able to do now is they're able to trace back disease before. So in the past, we thought, well, this was like maybe the end of December and the beginning of, of, of January in China, February and March in the U.S. Well, we're now beginning to realize that there are some people, when you look at their blood from December, there are a couple of people in December who already had antibodies. So presumably this was in Oregon, at least in December. And when you go back in China, it looks like there was probably some of this disease in November. Now you say, well, geez, if they knew this disease was there, why didn't they stamp it down? Well, it looked like a bad pneumonia. And I will tell you, over the years, I've treated hundreds of people with bad pneumonias. And so rarely do you know exactly what causes it. So the fact that there was sort of this cluster of weird pneumonia people didn't immediately figure out is not only not surprising, it actually would have been surprising had they figured it out. It wasn't until December when they saw such a cluster that they began to do viral cultures and they were able to get it. I don't think looking at the data, anybody believes this is a man-made virus. Uh, there is really nothing out there to suggest this is a man-made virus. This really suggests that it was somewhere in animals and then from animals came to humans. I think there's also good data now that this Wuhan wet market was likely not where it started, but the, the Wuhan wet market was likely where it spread. So it was likely there before this market and then spread. So Kayla says, I work at a smaller urgent care and test people for COVID. Where, when I would be able to get the vaccine? Will you be in group 1A? And will my clinic be notified or how would I know? So as soon as we start getting past the, the initial vaccine phase, you would be in the, in the group. Um, you would be in the group. Um, so the vaccine is coming out in three different groups. There's one group that's going to the pharmacies to vaccinate people in long-term care facilities, including uh, staff and patients. There's a second group of vaccine, largely the Pfizer vaccine, 
There's going to come from the state to the hospital. This is the vaccine that Mercy is going to get, 975 doses later in the week. And they're going to give it to the people in the hospital sphere. And then later in the month, we expect there to be about a, a couple of thousand doses coming. And that's going to vaccinate the people not in those two groups. And so as soon as we know the data on that, we will be spreading it out. Likely what we're going to do is we're going to have a group of uh, points of dispensing, 20 or so within the county, where people who are in those higher risk groups can go and get their vaccines. Now, it's possible that your urgent care could be one of those. And so I would encourage you to contact Teresa at DPHN tomorrow to see if your clinic would be one of those because you would be a good group to do that. So Joyce says, how do I get in line to get the vaccine? Well, if you are in group 1A, I think you're already in line. Uh, groups 1B, which are the other essential workers, and 1C, we've got another month or two to figure it out, so we're, we're, we're waiting. We will have a very clear process for people to sign up for the vaccine. And as Carol says, if we want the vaccine, is there a registry? And again, as I said, in the next month or so, there'll be a very clear process. So Christy says, is the vaccine going to be mandatory for healthcare workers? No. It is really hard to believe that we can make anything mandatory in this country. Um, and since this is an experimental vaccine under emergency use authorization, it's really hard to believe that you could make anything like this mandatory. So uh, Annalisha says, is the vaccine safe for women who are breastfeeding? We don't know because it wasn't tested on anybody who was breastfeeding. So we don't know if there's some kind of weird or rare reaction in either pregnant women or people who are breastfeeding. There's nothing to suggest there would be. It's just that there were no pregnant or breastfeeding women in these groups. So the recommendation is talk to your doctor. I said, well, it's kind of stupid. Your doctor is not going to know anything more about this than the FDA knows about it. And if somebody asked me, I'm pregnant, should I get the vaccine? Uh, I don't know because there's not been tested. Now, the good news is not everybody has to get the vaccine. That's the good news. Not everybody has to get the vaccine. We only need to get to be 60 or 70% coverage, which only means that 70 or 80% need to be vaccinated so that I, who can no longer breastfeed or have babies, should get the vaccine so that my uh, daughter-in-law, who is breastfeeding, doesn't need to worry about it. And so that's the way this works. So has there ever been an mRNA vaccine before? There have been some that have been tested. There was one against rabies that seemed to be very effective and uh, that seemed to be very effective and, and safe. So yes, there have been, but it was never approved because the, do the market for rabies vaccines is pretty small. You know, in the United States, maybe a couple hundred thousand a year at the most, right? They go to veterinarians and dog catchers and people have been exposed, but not very many. So in all of Douglas County, we probably do uh, 10 a year. So there's not a big market for it. And without being a big market for it, there really wasn't enough money to make the, the, the research go forward. Well, there's a lot of money in this one. So the research went forward very quickly with this mRNA vaccine. The hope is that this mRNA technology is going to be great. Imagine if this mRNA technology could get us a, a vaccine which would be 90% effective against herpes or 90% effective against staph or 90% effective against HIV or hepatitis C. That would be great. And so that's the hope is that this, these mRNA vaccines really will be that good and they'll allow us to really turn medicine around. So Russell says, I tested positive on 11-28, scheduled for surgery on 12-21. I'm almost feeling normal. It's safe to have my surgery. So again, you should talk with your, you should talk with your doctor. But in general, if you tested positive on 11-28, we would think you were no longer contagious by 12-8 and probably not likely to get it again before 12-21. So if you're feeling well and it's good with the doctor, I would think that would be okay. Emily said, are Pharmacists considered in Group 1A, yes. Now, again, Group 1A has gotten further dice and slice, and I'm not sure which dice and slice they come up with, but clearly pharmacists are 1A. So is the VA hospital in the same system of vaccine distribution? Oh, this is confusing. So the VA is getting vaccine directly from the feds. So it's going to go from the feds to the VA to the VA hospitals. They didn't get very much. We looked at they only ordered 73,000 doses, which sort of sounds like a lot, 
but there are a lot of VA hospitals. There are 400,000 workers in the VA, so obviously 73,000 doses are not going to nearly cover what goes on there. So I'm not exactly sure what that means. So when can teachers uh, expect to get the vaccine? They should be in uh, Group 1B, which are the essential workers, and they should get the vaccine. I actually saw the plan for vaccinating teachers today, and I think it's pretty darn good. So Brooklyn says, do you think COVID will ever go away fully, or is this something we will have around all the time like the flu? Um, I listened to a long talk about this the other day. <clears throat> the flu is always around because the flu has a large group of animal reservoirs. So birds and pigs that get the flu. So in the summertime when there's not very much flu around, it's still there in 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 birds and pigs and it recombines and then people get it. And other diseases that are uh, only in humans, like measles, is only in humans. And so measles can stay away a long time, although it never fully goes away because there's still little reservoirs in Africa and Asia where there is, um, where there is measles, so that would happen. This is a disease which, I remember we talked about minks and, and big cats. Again, we don't know if there are going to be animal reservoirs. We think there may be which would make it more like the flu. On the other hand, it may be that mink and, and big cats are just kind of dead end, in which case it would be more like measles. To get it fully, fully, fully gone, like we got for smallpox, is really unlikely. So smallpox, the eradication of smallpox, was perhaps the greatest thing medicine has ever done. Smallpox is a terrible disease. So smallpox is a disease that would go around, and when it were around, people would get deathly ill with it. They would get covered with these pox, would have a high death rate, and would be really quite contagious. And so it was the very first thing that we had vaccines for. In fact, vac vaccines come from the word vaccinia, which means the, the virus that causes cowpox in cows. And so back many, many years ago, what people realized was that uh, milkmaids would get cowpox from cows, but then they didn't seem to get smallpox. And Edward Jenner, a genius, recognized that, well, wait a minute, maybe if we gave other people cowpox, they wouldn't get smallpox. So what they did is they used vaccinia, which was the, which was the uh, cowpox virus, gave it to people, and that's how it worked. And you then did not get smallpox. And using that technique, we were able to get rid of smallpox in the world. So the last case of smallpox was back in the last century, we were able to get rid of that disease. I don't think that's going to happen with this because there's so many asymptomatic people. So with smallpox, you knew had smallpox, I and mean, it's pretty obvious. And, and there were no asymptomatic cases of smallpox. So you could track down the case of smallpox and get rid of it. In this disease, because there are a lot of asymptomatic cases, I don't think we're ever going to be fully rid of it. But we could be like there is in New Zealand, one case a day. Well, at one case a day, this is not a big deal because at one case a day, there's lots of one case a day things in Oregon that you never even hear about, like uh, mycoplasma pneumonia or uh, other kinds of pneumonia that we have a couple of cases a day in Oregon and you can get around them and whatever. So I think it's likely to get down to an area, a time where the disease is quite uncommon. Most people are immune because they've been vaccinated. And while it will still be kind of around and we'll still follow it, there won't be very many cases of it. Uh, so is, Tracy says, is the vaccine supply segregated in lot numbers in case of recalls? Absolutely. And how many, yeah, how many batch lots are there in the supply? I do not know the number. So I do not know the number of how many in a lot. The trouble is if you have large lots and then have a problem in a lot, then you have to recall a lot of vaccine. If you have smaller lots, you recall smaller amounts. However, the problem could be in more than one lot. So I do not, I, I tried to find that out. I could not find out the number of lots in a batch. Um, so Tracy says, what about tribal members and staff getting vaccines? What level are they? Well, again, this is confusing because Indian Health Service was going to distribute some vaccine directly to uh, tribal members, and then some tribes decided to go through the state 
And again, that has not been fully worked out. So Kayla says, is the Pfizer a live vaccine? No, there is no live vaccine in this. This is mRNA surrounded by a lipid nanoparticle. There's nothing alive in this. And so this is definitely not a live vaccine. And that's a good thing because live vaccines we do worry about because people are immunosuppressed because they've got a transplant. People are immunosuppressed because they're on a, on a lot of uh, steroids or people are immunosuppressed because of these, these disease-modulating drugs. Really need to be careful with live vaccines. It's not a live vaccine. So there's no contraindications for transplant patients and, and others now. It was not studied in lots of transplant patients, so we don't know. And again, if you said, look, I just had my heart transplant. I'm not exactly sure I should be first in line. Maybe you shouldn't be first in line. Maybe you should wait and let those of us who have not had heart transplants go first. All right, a couple more things here. How long does immunity last? This is the big question out there. Does the immunity last for three months? Does it last for six months? Are you need to get a booster? We do not know. Now, as I said, we had our, now our second case, you know, we've only had a thousand cases. Now we've had our second case where there's really likely a second infection. So the first fellow was somebody who helped back in New York in the springtime, got it well for several months, and then clearly got it again. We have another fellow now who got this about 60 days ago, very clearly was sick, very clearly got better. Now is sick again, test positive again. So... There are some redo cases, but again, that wouldn't be surprising. Let's say the vaccine gives you 90% protection, and let's say live infection gives you 90% infection, and then wouldn't be shocking that some of the people who have this early on would get it again. So how long does the immunity last? I would say the immunity lasts probably in general three months to a year, but not for everyone. I mean, there's some people who get the disease again. And some people will never develop immunity. So in general, I would say 90% for 3 to 12 months, which means some to wear a mask, we still need to socially distance until there's so little virus circulating in the community that we can decrease those protections. Yeah. So my octogenarian mom is so depressed. How can we help our frightened and depressed elders? Well, there's a couple of ways to do this. Um, my mom, my nonagenarian mom, who's 90, is watching. Um, and so there are a couple of things to do. So in that case, my sister was able to quarantine for two weeks, travel to visit my mom, should be very safe. And so they're together. And I think that makes my mom happy. And it makes me happy to know my mom is there. I think we can try and call. We can try and and visit as much as we can, but it is really hard. It is really hard. Now, if you do want to visit older people outside, 10 or 100 times safer than inside. So on a beautiful day, sitting out on the porch, six feet apart, wearing masks, is, is pretty, pretty darn safe. Um, being inside over a coffee table without masks, probably not so safe, but six feet apart, outside, masks on, probably pretty darn safe. So again, you have to look at the safety criteria. The older people really have gotten racked by this. So while we do have some deaths of people in their 60s and 70s, most of our deaths have been in the 80s because older people really, really seem to be, um, really seem to be having troubles. Scott says, once the vaccine is widely available, will there be a need for doctor's order for the vaccine? Well, you won't need an order from your doctor for the vaccine. I mean, just like now you can go to the pharmacy. You don't need a doctor's order to get it there at the pharmacy. We think most places will work like that. So at an urgent care or a, or a pharmacy or a fire station, if you get it, we think that will be, that will be enough uh, to get it. Now, the vaccine does have some local side effects. So in, in, in England, on the first day, they had two people who had anaphylaxis-like reactions. That worried us. There haven't been a lot more, uh, and there haven't been any in the U.S. yet. So that's that's the good news. Um, but I think the redness and soreness, the feelings of fatigue and whatever, really are fairly significant. In fact, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, which regulates pilots, says that if pilots get this vaccine, 
They can't uh, work in any safety sensitive situations like flying the plane for 48 hours after the vaccine. And so that is probable reasonable guidance for people who are involved in, uh, in important things. So for example, the extreme fatigue has been really noted by money people. So I'm not sure that if you're, for example, a truck driver, you wanna get this vaccine and then get on the road with the extreme fatigue. So that's one of the things, but I do not think you need a doctor's order. Um, one of the other things we want to talk about is spread in schools. So a very uh, good paper from England, which looked at all the schools in their in their in their summer term, and looked to see about spread. What they found was that most cases in schools came from the outside. So there were teachers who got infected outside and came to school, uh, kids who got infected home and came to school. When they came to school. There were not very many outbreaks at school so that people did spread this at home and in parties and whatever. Sometimes staff spread it from one staff to another. Not surprising. You know, in, in between students, you'd go to the break and have a cup of coffee and take your mask down. There was some spread there. There was occasional spread between student and student. But in general, there was very little spread at school which would suggest that for many, school may be the safest place to be because when kids are not at school, and I talk to, to parents when I see them in the practice and, and say, well, they're not going to school, and I see you're working, what's happening during the day? Oh, well, they're over to a friend's house where a bunch, six or eight other kids are. Well, at that other house where there are six or eight other kids not wearing masks, it's probably less safe than if they were at school where they were six feet apart and wearing their masks. So schools is a terrible, terrible problem. What do we do with schools? Do we open them? Do we close them? And I tell you, I've been working a lot on that, and I, I, I just don't know the right answer. What I do know, though, is we really need to be nice to each other. There has been so much ugliness about the schools, and I get these emails every day. And it's like, you are totally the worst person in the world because you said... And schools should open. And then you're the worst person in the world because you said schools should not open. And it's like, oh, I can't, I can't be both at the same time. And, and so it is really hard. I'm just asking people to be kind and to recognize that people see risk differently. And so as we've said before, there are people who ride motorcycles and jump out of perfectly good airplanes with a parachute. Those are not things I would do because my risk tolerance for those things is low. Um, but otherwise, I'm feeling pretty healthy. So my risk tolerance, for example, for seeing patients in the clinic is moderate. So I actually see kids in the clinic. I do wear a mask and whatever, but I'll see them. Whereas other people who would be exactly my age and maybe even in my exact situation would say, oh, Bob, uh, you know, we think seeing a patient in the, in the clinic would be way high risk and I wouldn't do it. And so I would only do things only by telehealth. Uh, and so people have slightly different risk tolerances, and it's going to be exactly the same in school. There are going to be some teachers who are caring for their elderly mom who don't want to go to school. There are going to be some young people who are otherwise reasonably healthy who look at that risk and think, I want to go to school because this is my great love and passion to teach students, and I want to go to school. What I'm asking is that people be kind to each other and recognize that we see risk differently. And just because you see risk in one way, it's not the way that we all see risks. Um, so Sherry says, my parents are at Linus Oaks in independent living. What priority is it for the vaccine? So there are many different living situations in Oregon. So there's skilled nursing facilities. There's, a, uh, there's uh, assisted living, there is memory care, and then there's independent living. Those are all in high priority groups. We have not yet exactly figured out where independent living fits, as opposed to people, for example, living in an apartment where there may be other people, young people who might spread the disease more. We haven't figured that out. Diane says, can dentists administer the vaccine? We believe that the number of people who can administer the vaccine is going to be really broadened to include all the people who currently do it now, but to also include uh, EMTs, to also include pharmacy techs, to also include dental staff. However, I have not seen the final sign-off on dental staff. I have seen the final sign-off on those other two groups, but not the final sign-off on dentists. I would think they could. Um, I, I would think that dentists would and should. I mean, dentists are pretty darn smart. 
and they really are incredibly good healthcare providers. They already are giving you shots, I hope, when you get your Novocaine, and I would think this one is gonna be a much easier shot to give than, a, than a, uh, a dental block. So I think they should be able to, but I've not seen the final rule on that. But yeah, we're expecting more and more people to be able to do this. Uh, nurses, doctors, PAs, nurse practitioners, but we're also gonna expand it to others. Okay, a couple more things and then we'll call it a night. Um, so, uh, one of the one of the questions that came up was about um, about how this vaccine is going to when will this vaccine get to everyone and again we do not know the final answers to this but what we think is that in December and January the people in the one A group hospitals and nursing home people will get their first dose twenty one to twenty eight days later they get the second dose we think in January and February. Uh, that people who are essential workers, and essential workers is a broad definition, but that in, includes anybody involved in transport, anybody involved in wood products for whatever reason, anybody involved in education, and anybody involved in the su food supply would get this then in the January, February time frame. That, that people, other high people at, at high risk will get it in the February, March time frame, and that then everybody else will be able to get it in the March through May time frame. Now that assumes that everything goes perfectly, that, uh, that, that there's no hiccups along the way, there's no manufacturing problems, there's no recall of lots, there's no nothing else. But if everything goes perfectly, it looks like by May and June that everybody, could, everybody who wants a vaccine could get a vaccine. There's lots that can go wrong though. Uh, just like in any big project like that, there's lots that can go wrong. But that's my hope. You know, my, my dearest hope is that by the 4th of July, we've got about 60% of the people immunized. In July and August, we're up to 80%. And then so come next September, I'm able to say, and I can report today that we've had no new cases for one week, in which case we can get rid of masks, in which case we can get rid of almost all restrictions. And in, in, in almost every case, we can go back to doing things almost like we did them before. Still not exactly sure that I want to have big raves and bar parties and whatever, but for the most part, we could get back to a much more normal way of life. Okay, one more thing. So you know what you know what I asked for Christmas for back in March and April was a simple $1 spit test where you could in the morning spit in a little cup, take your shower, come out and say, oh, I'm negative, and be comfortable that you go to work. If it was positive, you would then have another one to do a more complicated accurate test i would stay home until i got the results of that test the next day and at most i would miss one day but anytime i was positive you would know so that's what i asked for back in march and i haven't gotten it yet but i see i see this week from tulane that they have a system using a technology called crispr an incredibly complicated technology where they're able to do this uh, the saliva test get results within a few hours that are really quite accurate so we are getting closer and closer and closer to getting there. What I'm seeing is that these testing technologies are going to get really increase in the next six months as vaccine increases in the next six months. And as we learn more about the disease, that really truly by next summer, we can really have a big celebration because this disease will be mostly behind us. Again, with the question before, do we think it'll be 100% behind us? No, there'll still be some cases um, uh, because... It has to be gone in the whole world before it's gone, right? In the whole world. Now, the vaccines we're buying in the U.S. with these huge deep freeze requirements or whatever aren't going to work in sub-Saharan Africa. They're not going to work in, um, in Borneo. And so it's going to take a long time to get all of the other world vaccinated because uh, this people move around. Uh, people travel from one country to another. And because of that, to get the disease really down, we're going to need to get the disease uh, down in other areas. But the good news is there are other countries that have done it. New Zealand and Australia. It's nearly eradicated in New Zealand and Australia. It's very low in Taiwan. They have not had a death from COVID in Taiwan in, in many weeks now. Uh, South Korea, battling with it, but they're having a couple of hundred cases. 
uh, Japan working on it. They have a couple of hundred cases. But, you know, they really have it way under control, so much under control, that much of their life is back to normal. China has had very few cases. They did a tremendous amount of work early on, and they've got very low cases, and their life is pretty much back to normal. Their economy is really humming, whereas in the U.S. we're still struggling. But we'll get there. So the hope is that by next summer we'll get to a point where things will be better. But to do that, everything has to go right. We can't overwhelm our hospitals in December or January and expect to get to the summer doing well. We can't... Um, we can't have people get. We can't have so many people die that um, that it, it so affects life. So there's things we can do. So between now and the next couple of weeks, I think we just need to do the kind of things that people are doing now. They are wearing masks. They're social distancing. They're doing a good job of staying out. I think we just need a few more weeks of that to keep the cases down, and by keeping the cases down, to move forward. Now, I know businesses are suffering being closed. I work, I was on the board for the YMCA at a long time. And the YMCA is very much a shell of what it was before because it can't, can't have a lot of indoor stuff, but they're brilliant. They figured out a way to do outdoor exercise safely using these tents. Uh, they figured out a way to raise money from other people. So there are glimmers of hope that during this time, where we really do need to be careful about what we're doing, that uh, that these things can survive. And I know this is really tough for bars, and really tough for restaurants. I have friends who run bars and restaurants, and these are these these are tough times. And I think we as a society really need to help them. So if you can shop locally, if you can do takeout at local restaurants, that'll be really great because that will help them get through this, so that next summer we can really party and celebrate. All right, it looks like we are at the last of our questions here, and it's 6.52, so we'll call it a night. Again, this is Dr. Bob Danhofer, Public Health Officer in Douglas County. Thanks again.